speaker in this section is somebody I've, I've uh, come across and heard about for quite some time. And uh, my PhD student, Martina. Martina, you're here, aren't you? Yeah, Martina. Martina probably had her confirmation um, seminar the other day. And uh, who, but who had been lurking in the, um, the uh, space before, the day before, was Francesca. Uh, and left behind were some words and some fragments of paper. So you were already had announced yourself before today. Uh, Francesca, uh, now Associate Professor Francesca Rendleshaw, um, is, uh, uh, works at now at uh, the School of Media and Communications at RMIT. She is co-director of the non-fictional lab research group uh, and writers immersion and cultural exchange. An award-winning novelist, memoirist, memor memoirist and essayist, her Doctor of Creative Arts was from the University of Wollongong. Uh, and received an examiner's commendation for outstanding thesis. Her most recent book is the critically acclaimed memoir come novel, Bite Your Tongue, Spin Effects Press, shortlisted for the 2012 Colin Ritter Literary Award. In 2013, she was recipient of the International Nonfiction Writers Fellowship to the University of Iowa Nonfiction Writing Program USA. And she also has her website for you to go and explore. Francesca, please. It's a great pleasure to be here at this DCA, DC, DCA symposium, what a wonderful thing. And thank you also to the University of Wollongong for sponsoring me here. Um, I'm going to present this presentation as performance called Unbiting Tongue. This writing aloud, as Roland Barthes might call it, grain of the throat, articulation of the body, the tongue, as a sort of Socratic dialogue asking, what do I know? A Socratic dialogue that searches for what something is as opposed to what it isn't. A dialogue between my making and my making about the making and my thinking about the making and vice versa. A dialogue that will mirror the original process of making this work in both form and substance. A dialogue is a test, if you like, to see if it works, because I've not presented my doctoral work in this way before. A dialogue employing a non-fiction unconvention, a toggle list. And a dialogue a la the great essayist Michel de Montaigne's famous question, que sais-je, what know I? First an image and a prologue. What do I know? My mother's name is Angel, and she's buried near the Big Pineapple in Queensland, outside a little town called Bly Bly. These are my mother's hands. They look angelic, don't they? Supplicating. Are they dancing, covering her eyes? I wonder what was wrong with her that day. After my mother died, we found piles of x-rays, just like these, in large envelopes underneath her bed. You could piece her body together. There were scans for her head, her mouth and nasal passages, her chest and stomach, her pelvis, hands, feet, knees and feet. There were two difficulties with bite your tongue, apart from the usual problems of doing a doctorate. The first hurdle was the difficult subject matter, my mother, what do I know? My mother was a book burner. Sometimes she was so agitated about the books the teachers and librarians insisted I read at school, she was on fire. I could see smoke and flame coming out of her orifices, her ears, her mouth. Mind you, when I was young, I didn't, know what, I didn't not want to know any of this, and I got into the habit of not listening and not taking any notice. It was safer that way. Otherwise, I thought, I would go up in smoke too, 
that she'd take me out to the backyard next to the chooks and the ducks and slip me into the incinerator as well, burn me along with the books, burn me for being naughty. I didn't dare read any of the wicked books she was talking about. She had a list of them. But I tried to imagine what lay between their covers, what could be so bad. Doctorates are about problem solving or creative solutions, as Paul Goff um, would have it. My original question or problem went something like this. Can I write my mother? Am I mad? Is it even possible? What could be so bad? My mother, Angel Rendell Short, or Mother Joy, Dr. Joy, as her doppelganger in my novel was called, was a morals crusader, an anti-smut campaigner, an activist. She was on a mission from God to save the children of Queensland. Growing up, I knew about some things to do with her campaign because, she, because they involved me directly. Other things I've uncovered in the archive. Bit by bit, I've pieced together a picture. I found out, for instance, there are a number of book lists, both long and short, that were circulated and published in different forms, such as in pamphlets, in letters to the press and to concerned parents, in delegations to government. I discovered she was discussed at length in the Queensland Parliament and that she appeared before a parliamentary inquiry. I found a letter from my mother in the National Archives of Australia in Canberra, written to the Governor-General of Australia, copied to the Prime Minister of Australia and to the Premier of Queensland, Joe Bielke-Peterson. What I read made my heart curdle with shame. We actively encourage the presence in our homes, pardon, we actively discourage the presence in our homes of lewd literature and sex-saturated books. What do I know? What saved me was my made-up heroine, my protagonist, my imagined interlocutor, Mother Joy's daughter. She knew the story she wanted to tell. She had voice and intent from the beginning. Her name was Glory, Glory Solida. Because the second hurdle was that my subject matter, my mother, died halfway through my candidature, before I was finished, before I knew where I was going. Curseja, what know I? Some stories are hard to tell. They bite back. To write this one, I've had to come at it obliquely, give myself over to the writing with my face half turned, give my story to someone else to tell. My chosen hero is a girl named Glory. She sits in the dictionary, smack between gloom, glop, gloop, gloppen, glore, on the top side of the column, and gloss, glossal, glossenthrax, glossary, on the bottom. If I just let glory guide me, I told myself over and over through the course of doing this DCA, everything would be all right. As Anna Gibbs writes, it is possible to say all sorts of things if one's words are not really one's own. It was about trust, trusting that the process and practice of writing the tongue, as Helene Sassou conceives of écriture feminine, would create in me the space to desire. Glory knows she can never tell what it is, tell her mother what it is she is writing, that she is writing at all. Won't her tongue be cut out for doing such a thing? So Sue argued it is possible to construct a non-acquisitional space of exploration born out of desire, where the self can experience the non-self or other in mutual respect and harmony. Susu says, I ask of writing what I ask of desire. Glory wishes she could remember her very first taste of tongue, the first mouthful, that first bite. It is like trying to remember her very first kiss. Writing this now, Glory can feel the roughness of her sister's tongue on her own the taste of warm saliva, her first kiss. She smells her sister's perfume, Chanel 5, the one she wears today, a 
A memory of forbidden desire swells within her. She feels the blood in her temples thudding on either side of her face, pulsing visibly like the gills of a fish. She wonders privately, will writing this change things, change how she feels, change what happens? What do I know? By writing a body on the page, a discovered body, an improper body, you reclaim your own. This experience must be a practice, as Sue insists. It is all to and fro, sound and silence. It is in the doing, the making and remaking, the composing, constructing and breaking of rules, transgression, that things will emerge if anything is going to emerge. To unbite tongue, I had to allow the language of process to lead me through. I found little Francesca in my mother's scrapbook, a book bound in red ribbon. She was stuck into these pages next to a photograph of my mother, Courier Mail, 1975, page three. It was my mother, all right. She was dressed in the caftan she was rather fond of wearing in those days. Then this, the first paragraph. Mrs. Angel Rendell Short of Brookfield said yesterday that a book given to her daughter, Francesca, as an English textbook at school would teach her to be a permissive rebel. <laughs> it also said that I was willing to sit out of English classes in order to protect myself from the danger of being corrupted. <laughs> Teenagers are incapable of discerning and making a judgment about what they read, especially when they have nothing but gutter standards. What do I know? Angel was quick to condemn her daughter to hell. This was always going to be a difficult project. It was a shame story, a story of a mother who was good at withholding love and affection, who never approved. It is a story of a mother who was aghast when she found out that one of her daughters was a writer. What do I know? I like irony. I look up the words permissive and rebel, wonder what a rebel might look like, permissive meaning tolerant, liberal, especially in sexual matters, from the Latin permissio as in permit, and rebel meaning a person who fights or resists control and authority from the Latin rebellus or bellium as in war. Permissive rebel, permissio rebellious, permit war, I like the way these words look in the newspaper, the black and white print, how the typesetters spaced out the letters horizontally and vertically, how the last letter E in permissive separates out from the rest, the way it accidentally drops below an imaginary bottom line as if it is being set free and riding away. <laughs> what I learnt in the making of this work is that it is in the process that we become in the making that we are made. We look like we are from the same family, don't we? No mistaking. With the same bone structure around the nose and mouth. Look at the thing that pricks, the cock of my knee, how it softens my body, makes me lean towards her. Here, I am thinking isogetically, as a methodical approach as to as opposed to working exegetically, where the researcher sits in the mess and the making of the work rather than analysing findings ex post facto, as if it is a finished thing ready for examination. These two words come from the same etymological root, egesis, to seek, ex meaning out of for exegesis, and eis meaning into for eisegesis. Thinking eisegesis allows for a more subjective exploration, for loose thinking, play and uncertainty, faulty interpretation. Thinking eisegetically allowed me to write into silence, to dream my way into story. It allowed words to transmute on the page into necessary fiction, to receive an education of the heart, a la Susan Sontag, to make a different kind of world in which it is possible to lo learn love, to speak it, to write it, perform it.
There was nothing for it but to help. Blood heavy, Glory picked up book after book from the boxes at her feet and hurled the pages and covers into the, gal into the flames, a gulp behind her mother. She drowned out the noise of the fire and her questions by clicking her tongue on the inside of her mouth to make it raucous in her head. Sweat dripped sticky from the usual places, down the back of her neck, behind her ears, her knees, and from secret places too, from between her legs and between her small breasts. It was such hot work. Glory felt as though she was melting away, praying to Jesus all the while to make things right, to notice. What do I know? I was finding a body way of writing desire and writing shame. Glory as made up linguistic body was all skin and bone, hair and teeth. As researcher and writer, you become, you become both the narrator and the narrated. Pages fluttered everywhere. Paper flew about like birds circling the lights of a city. All those chapters upon chapters, all those hundreds and thousands and millions of words, even the birds in the chookyard joined in the din, honked and quacked about in protest. It filled glory with a kind of horror, but there was something irresistible about it too. She smiled at her mother, and her mother smiled back. What do I know? Because the other thing that saved me in this doctorate, aside from glory, was my supervisor, bless. Well, it was more that my mother's death saved me. What was a problem became a solution. I turned her death inside out. Her death gave me permission to draw close. And my supervisor, Melinda Bobbers, instructed me, be with the body, Francesca, here, find the tongue. So it was a way of proceeding, again, thinking isogetically. I made books out of jelly. I made books of jelly out of jelly. I called the exhibition A Book of Breathing. These jelly books brought memory and language and the body together and located the nexus of my work in the body as a performative act. I had to get dirty to make this work. There was pineapple in the jelly. I even put a copy of that photograph going to church into jelly and watched it grow mouldy and red and disintegrate into some kind of fluid. I made a jelly book with the word touch and its definition, part clear, part red with food colouring, everything was going as planned. Then, as I was preparing this particular plate for exhibition, turning the jelly upside down out of its mould, rushing as it happened because people were coming up the stairs of the Schloss in the opening, for the opening, it dropped and smashed all over the vinyl floor. I thought I had ruined the whole thing, but I scraped it up with my hands, found another white plate and shoved it into place on the table, just in time. <laughs> Touch. Stir sympathy or emotion in. Allow to enter one's mouth. What do I know? <coughs> A book of breathing opened me up. I wrote my mother's body onto the page. When my mother died, she was dressed in her favourite pale blue bed jacket. I helped the nurses and my sisters lay out her body in the hospital. We brushed her hair, we put a posy of orchids in her hands, we kissed her dead body. I kept her hairbrush, the bristles still full of her loose grey hair, took her rings from her fingers. I also kept her brie nylon blue bed jacket as a keepsake before anyone else threw it out. It was an old-fashioned garment made from the wonder fibre, British nylon. I like the fine lines of the horizontal pattern in the, in the nylon, how it drips dry quickly when washed. I like the idea of danger when thinking of the material's flammability. What would happen if there was a fire? It would never pass today's sleep test. Because what I've got to tell you is this. All the time I've been writing this story, 
Angel's blue nylon bed jacket has been hanging in my wardrobe. But the funny thing it is, it is only recently that I've read what it says on the other side of the tag because it has been stuck upside down, flat against one of my mother's pink crocheted coat hangers. When I turned it over, I discovered two words. Miss Gloria. <laughs> Not that my mother knew about glory, my glory story. I could never have told her that I was writing. She hated me writing. But I can't help wondering, did she ever turn over that tag like I did? Did she know Miss Gloria existed on the other side? Did she feel her tucked up and nestled against her neck? This Brie nylon clothes tag takes me back to the Wesley Hospital in Orkinflower in Brisbane, back to my mother's room, to trying to make her body comfortable in her final days, to a moment of softness, give. Miss Gloria lifts the ordinariness of a remembered gesture into poetic evocation, sparks the imagination, the silver and black thread of the tag, the tufting at the edges, the little hole on the stroke of the eye, attaches any thinking and feeling about my mother dying beside the Brisbane River to the fabric of words here, to the heft and weave of story, to unbiting tongue. What do I know? What do we know?